That is why, dear friends, when we sometimes hear the opinion that, for example, it would have been better for Ukraine if Hitler, not Stalin, had won the Second World War. It obviously comes from. This stems from a lack of familiarity with Hitler's theory. And second, it is based on modern knowledge of the nature of the Stalinist regime with its famines, repressions, and mass deportations. Hitler did not foresee the possibility of Ukraine's state existence. From the very beginning, he viewed its territory as a zone of German colonization, with a disenfranchised local population. Therefore, the tragedy of Ukraine in World War II was that it was caught between two totalitarian regimes that did not consider it a separate state. And its population and economic resources were used in their own interests, to achieve their imperial goals, inflicting enormous sacrifices on Ukrainians. How exactly did the National Socialists come to power? There is an interesting nuance here. Hitler remained an Austrian citizen until 1925. He received German citizenship only in 1932. The fact is that in 1925, when he was released from the Landsberg prison, he demonstratively renounced his Austrian citizenship. Because there was a threat of his deportation to Austria, after that, he managed to become a German citizen only at the age of 32, and then he was eligible to run for president. It was then, in 1932, that the presidential election was held, but he came in second, losing to Paul von Hindenburg. After his release from Landsberg prison in early 1925, Hitler met with the Bavarian prime minister and promised to stop all anti-government propaganda. On the contrary, to help the German authorities fight radicals and communists. Following these agreements, the authorities lifted the ban on the NSDAP. The Nazis announced that they were switching to legal methods of struggle and would now try to get elected to the German parliament. At the same time, their program in, accordingly, their leader, Adolf Hitler, remained unchanged, which distinguished the Nazi party from other political forces in Germany. Because others sometimes literally drowned in internal strife. The number of Nazis gradually increased. In 1923 it was 55,000, and in 1929, according to various sources, from 130 to 178,000 people. At that time, regular congresses of the NSDAP were held. Youth organizations began to be created, as opposed to communist youth organizations. But still, until the end of the 20s, the NSDAP remained an unpopular force, as evidenced by the results of the parliamentary elections of 1928. At that time, the party officially took part in the elections for the first time under the name of the NSDAP and received only two whole six-tenths of the votes, which was the ninth result and only 12 seats in the German parliament. It is likely that the NSDAP would have remained a locally unpopular party if not for the global economic crisis that erupted in the fall of 1929. The crisis hit Germany extremely hard, primarily because it was paying reparations and was highly dependent on foreign loans, which simply stopped being issued during the crisis. As a result, Industrial production in the country fell by 40% in three years, and 6 million Germans became unemployed. Only the United States has lost more people's jobs, but the population there is twice as large as in Germany. By the way, the population of the United States is now four times larger than that of Germany. And against the background of these tragic events, Hitler's criticism of the current government was gaining more and more supporters, and people were attracted to the NSDAP's social program. This program promised to completely eliminate unemployment. The majority of Germans, frankly, were ready to give up their democratic freedoms in order for a so-called strong hand to come to power and restore order in the country. As they sadly joked back then, democracy gave us only the freedom to be hungry. 
In addition, revanchism remained a popular theme for Germans who felt the outcome of World War I was unjust. In addition, Germany's situation was too complicated, and the search for those responsible for the defeat in World War I continued. Who was to blame? The Nazis always blamed Marxists and Jews. Therefore, the results of the next election clearly demonstrate how the NSDAP's popularity grew. In 1930, they came in second in the elections, winning over 19% of the vote and 107 seats, as opposed to 12 seats two years earlier. But this still did not mean coming to power. Their rise to power was the result of a very long political crisis, from which the government was trying to find at least some way out. So, follow the sequence of events. July of 1932, new parliamentary elections. The NSDAP wins first place with a very large margin of more than 37% of the vote and 230 seats. Hermann Göring, Hitler's deputy, was elected chairman of the Reichstag. However, Hitler himself refused to join the coalition government as a minister. He only wanted to be chancellor. President Hindenburg refused to appoint him chancellor. Or simply did not dare. Therefore, it was impossible to form a government in the absence of representatives of the largest Nazi party in parliament. There is no government, and new early parliamentary elections were held in November of 32. Moreover, the political struggle at this time is taking place in the context of increasing violence in the country, with clashes between Nazi stormtroopers and communist militants, where the number of victims is estimated at dozens. This time, in November 1932, the Nazis got worse results. In July it was 37%, and in November it was 33%. In July, there were 230 mandates, and in November, there were 196. But they still remained in first place. The Social Democrats came in second among all other parties. The Communists got 17% and third place. That is, the Nazis and the German Communists, 33 and 17%, got a majority in the parliament. But the parties categorically refused to enter into a coalition with each other, of course, but they also categorically refused to enter into a coalition with other political forces. The political crisis is dragging on, it has been going on for many months. And President Hindenburg was more afraid of the communists coming to power than the Nazis. As a field marshal and an aristocrat, he naturally treated Corporal Hitler with contempt and caution. but still considered him a better option, Hitler was more patriotic, more patriotic German power. In addition, at that time in Europe and in Germany, Hitler was partly perceived as a kind of bad copy of Mussolini. And Mussolini, as we already know, during the 20s more or less managed to lead Italy out of a long political and economic crisis. In the face of this protracted political crisis, Hindenburg was granted extraordinary powers under the Weimar Republic's constitution. In particular, the right to appoint a chancellor even without the support of a majority in parliament. And after a personal meeting on January 30, 1933, Hindenburg appointed Hitler chancellor. This first cabinet of Hitler was called the Government of National Salvation, and was a coalition in which the Nazis won only three seats. In addition to Hitler, Wilhelm Frick became the Minister of the Interior. And the minister without a portfolio is Hermann Goering. The other nine portfolios in the government were given to non-partisans or representatives of the Conservative National People's Party. Only after that, representatives of big business began to actively finance the Nazis. The process started earlier, 
but it was the emergence of a government with Hitler at the head and a strong election result that led to the creation of a 3 million mark NSDAP campaign support fund. Hitler secured new early parliamentary elections, which were scheduled for March 5. It was the third parliamentary election in a year. But shortly before these elections, on the evening of February 27, the Reichstag was set on fire. 24-year-old Dutch communist Marinus van der Lubbe was found guilty of arson. This event is well known, but all its details are still unknown. There are two main versions. The first version is that the Nazis themselves set fire to the Reichstag. And Marinus van der Lubbe was simply made a scapegoat. And the second version, and this is the more popular version now, is that van der Lubbe set fire to the Reichstag himself. or the option that the Nazis knew about his plans to set fire to the Reichstag, but did not intervene and simply took advantage of the situation. Van der Lubbe himself was arrested. A trial was held in Leipzig, where he was sentenced to death, and in January 1934 he was executed by guillotine. The burning of the Reichstag was perceived by the German authorities as a signal for the beginning of a communist uprising. To get ahead of him, the very next day, on February 28, 1933, Hindenburg signed a decree on the protection of the people and the state. And according to the decree, freedom of speech, press, assembly, and rallies were abolished in the country, and it was allowed to check correspondence and listen to telephone conversations. Massive searches and arrests began and up to 27,000 people were arrested in a few months. To hold such a huge number of prisoners, the first concentration camps began to be set up in Germany. However, it should be noted that most of the prisoners were released fairly quickly, in the range of several weeks to several months, after the inspection. On March 5, New early parliamentary elections were held, in which the Nazi party again took first place, but with a large result of 44%. The result was excellent, but it still did not allow them to form a government on their own. As before, the Social Democratic Party came in second, and the Communist Party third. But immediately after the election, the Communist Party was banned and their parliamentary mandates were cancelled and the Communists lost 81 seats in total. Now, after this abolition, the Nazi party has gained a majority in Parliament. After all, in the absence of 81 deputies, the Nazis created a small but mono-majority with their own number of deputy mandates. On March 24, 1933, the new parliament passes the law, on overcoming the hardship of the people and the state. This law gave the government the right to pass laws bypassing the parliament. Even those that did not comply with the constitution of the Weimar Republic. Thus, the executive branch gained legislative powers, and the parliament actually turned into a decorative body imitating democracy. In addition, the government was given full freedom to sign any international agreements. Such emergency powers were granted to the government for four years, but then extended until the fall of the Nazi regime in 1945. Finally, on July 14, 1933, the law, on the prohibition of the creation of new parties, was adopted, which was called that, but in fact, this law declared the Nazi party the only legal party in the state. All left-wing parties were simply banned, and right-wing non-Nazi political parties were asked to either join the NSDAP or to liquidate themselves.
And after July 14, the official opposition in Germany simply did not exist, it could only be illegal. However, Hitler faced a very unexpected threat from his fellow party members. A conflict with stormtroopers under the command of Ernst Röhm began. He applied for the post of Minister of War. Now his stormtroopers were actually competing with the army and police, which were under Hitler's control. The stormtroopers were armed with cold steel and firearms. Some of them were even armed with machine guns, so it was something like a militia. So, the situation was like this. Stormtroopers, which were originally created to protect the Nazi party, to achieve their political goals, including the use of brute force. This is a kind of huge militia, a state within a state. They are run by Rome, and he wants the attack aircraft to be declared part of the German armed forces. And then he would be able to lead these armed forces, but Hitler understood the consequences of such actions. In this case, Rome would get a huge power apparatus in his hands and then he could simply eliminate Hitler. He therefore decides to be proactive and accuse Rome of preparing a coup d'état. On June 30th and July 1st, 1934, Hitler and his supporters organized the famous Night of the Long Knives. The executors were the state army and the SS security units. Earlier, they were created as Hitler's bodyguards in the party, i.e., the most loyal to the Führer, competitors of Ernst Röhm's stormtroopers. During the Night of the Long Knives, according to official figures, a little more than 80 people died, but according to modern researchers, 150-200, including leading figures of the stormtroopers, including Ernst Röhm himself. But in the course of this, not only the leaders of the stormtroopers fell victim, but also politicians of the Weimar Republic who had nothing to do with it at all but criticized Hitler. Or simply those who have interfered with him in the past, such as Gregor Strasser. Gregor Strasser used to be a member of the Nazi party, but then he and Hitler parted ways. What happened on the night of the Long Knives was explained to the people as a precautionary measure against the inevitable putsch of the stormtroopers. And the result was an extraordinary increase in Hitler's power. Weakening of the assault units, their role was reduced mainly to propaganda functions. Conversely, the strengthening of the role of the SS, the security forces of the Nazi party and the Gestapo, the secret state police Geheime Staatspolizei. Very soon afterward, an event occurred that completed the formation of the Nazi dictatorship. On the morning of August 2, 1934, Paul von Hindenburg died, at the age of 86. This is a photo from his funeral. Immediately after his death, the post of German president was abolished. And Hitler assumed the powers of Führer and Reich Chancellor, i.e., head of state and head of government. In addition, the position and powers of the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. Previously, the president had these powers. To legitimize this decision, a referendum was held on August 19, 1934, in which almost 90% of the participants supported this innovation. This was the second Nazi referendum, as the first took place in November 1933 and then 95% spoke in favor of Germany leaving the League of Nations. We talked about this political practice, which the Nazis resorted to several times during their rule, in the pseudo-referendums issue, where we compared Hitler's actions to Putin's actions in the temporarily occupied territories. Thus, in August 1934, the Nazi dictatorship was finally established in Germany. But it is worth noting that, 
Despite the ideological closeness of Hitler's Nazism and Italian fascism, there were very serious differences between them. German historian and journalist Sebastian Gaffner emphasized, In the ranks of 20th century dictators, Hitler stands somewhere between Mussolini and Stalin, closer to Stalin on closer inspection than to Mussolini. There is nothing more wrong than calling Hitler a fascist. Fascism is the rule of the upper classes of society based on artificially created mass enthusiasm. Hitler was a populist who relied on the masses, not the elites, in a sense, he was a people's tribune who sought absolute power. His most important means of power was demagoguery, and his instrument of power was not a differentiated hierarchy, but a chaotic tangle of uncoordinated mass organizations that were held together only by his personality at the head. All of these movements were more left-wing than right-wing. Thus, in the summer of 1934, Hitler reached the fullness of power and the peak of his domestic political success. For him, the time had come for a large-scale transformation of the country to the Nazi system, according to his program, and, of course, for a transition to changes in foreign policy, primarily to the destruction of the Versailles system of international relations. In just five years, this policy would lead to the outbreak of the bloodiest conflict in the history of World War II. Dear friends, let me remind you that we, together with the Volunteer Organization Group of 35, are conducting a large and very important collection of attack drones for the 68th Separate Hunting Brigade named after Alexa Dovbush, which is currently conducting combat operations against the Russian occupiers in Donbass. This weapon will help stop enemy attacks and create opportunities for a pointed massive attack to break through Russian positions. The total amount required is $14,000. This amount will be used to purchase two ground control stations, two drones and four kamikaze drones. Please, dear friends, join in. Each Harivnya is important. Each of your Harivnya brings our victory over the enemy closer. Dear viewers, unfortunately, we have problems with the internet today, so there will be no answers to questions from the chat. Thank you very much for your attention. Do not forget to subscribe to History Without Myths. Don't forget to click the bell, like this issue and leave a comment. Thank you very much for your attention, and see you next time. Glory to Ukraine!